Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education. I'm delighted to welcome you here to today's presentation. Uh, uh, our speaker today is Saul Geiser. Um, Saul is not a stranger to Berkeley at all. He got his PhD here in sociology and taught in the sociology department until he was lured away to the office of the president, where he was for... Um, uh, tumultuous and momentous years in the history of um, uh, the University of California in charge of the analysis um, for uh, um, admissions, um, uh, the research in, in relationship to admissions. Uh, I think many of you here probably share my conviction that enrollment is the absolute center of policy both for public and for private institutions of higher education. And Saul is one of the best researchers I have ever met on this topic, and he is doing very important work on race in the SAT, and he's going to tell us about it today. So, Saul. Thank you. Oh. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, the findings I'm about to present um, were almost an afterthought. A, a few years ago, two years ago, uh, I completed a study of admissions uh, at UC going back uh, over a 20-year period. And of course, I was primarily interested in the question of who got in and who, who didn't get in. But uh, as part of that research, I, of course, had a database on the much larger number of students who applied to the University of California. Uh, whether or not they were admitted. Um, this database, uh, almost uh, one, or over 1.1 1 .1, uh, million California residents who applied for admission between 1994 and 2011 uh, uh, inclusive, the, the eight, this, over this 18 year period. Uh, these students, are, uh, these SAT takers, uh, represented about 40% of all students in California who took the SAT during that same period. Um, what I found was surprising, so surprising in fact, that it took me a while to uh, trust, trust the results myself. And I think they may surprise you as well. Uh, my talk will be divided into three parts. First, I'll uh, present the main findings in the relationship between race and SAT scores that we can see in the UC applicant data. Uh, then I'll spend some time interrogating and, and probing the data, kicking the tires, so to, so to speak, to see uh, the strengths and weaknesses uh, of these findings. And then finally, uh, I'll look at uh, some of the policy implications uh, for these findings, uh, if confirmed. I want to emphasize at the outset that these findings are still preliminary and much more work needs to be done to determine whether the UC applicant pool and the, and the, the trends we observe there uh, are representative of broader trends, uh, uh, either in uh, or nationally or in, or in other states. Uh, but, um, and uh, I want also the context for this, uh, for this study is, of course, the uh, forthcoming U.S. Supreme Court decision in Fisher. The Supreme Court has taken the unusual step of rehearing a case that they've already decided, and that case is due to be decided uh, again in, in the spring. And uh, this is the context for the present study. Uh, the presentation will run about 45 minutes, I, I hope, uh, and that will leave ample time for questions and discussion because I realize uh, uh, many of you may have different takes on both the data and the interpretation of the data that I'm going to put forward here. Okay, first, uh, just very quickly, the data and the sample. The sample, I've already said, uh, all California resident applicants for UC admission from 1994 on. SAT scores are a composite of the verbal and math. Uh, um, California is an SAT state. Most students, uh, at least until very recently, have taken the uh, SAT. Uh, for most of the period covered by my study, only about 14% uh, or so took the ACT. Where students took only the ACT, their scores were uh, translated into uh, SAT equivalent scores. Uh, high school GPA is the so-called weighted GPA that uh, UC uses for admissions purposes. That is weighted for uh, uh, advanced placement and honors courses. Students get an extra grade point. If they get a, a B, which would normally count a 3.0 in an AP course, they'll get four points for the course instead. And that's what UC uses uh, in admissions. 
Family income is derived from the uh, both uh, UC application and financial aid forms subject to audit. In my study, I've used the log of fab uh, family income. It creates a more normal distribution, standard practice in studies of this kind. Uh, parents' education is also derived from the UC application and is that of the highest educated parent. And finally, underrepresented minorities are, uh, include uh, students who've been historically underserved uh, in higher education, Latinos and blacks. Uh, however, due to small cell sizes and uh, concerns about possible confi confidentiality of student, finding, or student uh, records, um, uh, it excludes uh, Native Americans, which, uh, which are a very small uh, portion uh, of the applicant pool through uh, this period. Using regression techniques, uh, I entered the three main socioeconomic variables, family income, parents' education, and race ethnicity, into a regression model to determine the extent to which they explained or stat statistically accounted for uh, the variance or differences in SAT scores uh, uh, among UC applicants. The results were stunning, as you can see here. After falling slightly from about 25% to 21% in 1994, from 1994 to 1998, from then on we've seen a, a strong and steady increase uh, to the point which uh, in t by 2011, the last year for which I have obtained data from UC's Office of the President, 35% uh, of the variance in students' SAT scores can be explained, statistically accounted for by these three factors known largely at student birth, except of course income can change over the course of a student's lifetime, but for the most part these factors uh, your, your SAT scores, over a third of them, uh, are determined uh, by uh, the accident of, of birth. When the same regression uh, uh, was run using high school GPA as the uh, dependent variable, as you can see here, there was uh, very little effect. Uh, uh, high school GPA, uh, 7 to uh, 8% in, in 2011. A little variance there, but uh, a little change there, but, but not a lot. Now, this is not to suggest that socioeconomic factors cause SAT scores in any simple or direct fashion. Factors such as family income or, uh, or parental education do, do not exert their influence directly, but through more proximate mediating experiences such as test prep services or the quality of schools that students attend or the number of books in the, house, in the family or in, in, in the home, uh, issues of, the, of that sort. Um, Nevertheless, even without being able to observe those mediating experiences directly, regression analysis enables one to uh, assess the relative importance of different background factors in predicting test performance. Here is the standardized coefficient, the, or beta weight as it's called, on parents' education in predicting SAT scores. For example, in 1994, the beta weight for parents' education was 0.27. What that means is for every one standard deviation change in parental education in our sample, SAT scores moved or increased by 0.27 of a standard deviation. So this, the, this is calculated by the ratio of the standard deviation for the independent variable to the uh, standard deviation of the dependent variable in this case, as I said, understood what that is, okay. In contrast, the beta weight for family income uh, has shown a small but steady increase uh, during this 18-year period, uh, growing from 0.13 in 1994 to 0.19 in uh, 2011. But the most striking change has been the growing salience of race. Uh, by 2011, underrepresented minority status had become more important than either family income or parents' education in predicting students' SAT scores. And when the results are pulled across applicant cohorts, the SAT scores, excuse me, race is the strongest predictor of SAT scores over the last four years that I have uh, data for, uh, for which I have data. Contrary to expectation then, it appears that racial and ethnic differences have been growing rather than diminishing. And equally significant, these differences remain, these racial and ethnic differences remain even after controlling for differences in family income and parental education. A related finding concerns the impact of uh, test scores on admission of underrepresented minority students. 
College Board and other proponents of the SAT often tend to downplay the correlation between socioeconomic factors and test scores. They argue that other admissions criteria, such as high school grades, uh, have the same adverse impact on low-income and minority students. According to one prominent advocate of the SAT, quote, the indisputable fact is that both high school grades and SAT scores are reflections of the same educational system with all its flaws and, equity and inequities, unquote. Statements such as this obscure a fundamental point. The magnitude of the effect is much greater for test scores than for high school grades. The blue bars in this graph uh, show the proportion of underrepresented minorities within each decile of the applicant pool when students are ranked by high school GPA. As you can see, there is some, some significant strat uh, uh, racial stratification uh, when you uh, rank students on high school GPA. But the red bars show the proportion of uh, underrepresented minority students when the same students, these are not different students, these are the same students just ranked by another measure. Uh, SAT scores. Uh, the difference is stark. Uh, at the bottom of the pool, 60% of those in the lowest SAT decile are students of color, uh, compared to 39% uh, in the lowest high school GPA decile. Conversely, at the top of the pool, students most likely to be admitted, uh, the minority proportion in the highest GPA uh, decile uh, is more than double that in the highest SAT decile so that the relative importance that colleges and universities place on these two criteria can make a significant difference in who gets admitted. A last set of findings concerns, concerns the predictive validity of the SAT. Predicting student performance in college is a raison d'etre for admissions tests. If the SAT were a good predictor, its uh, adverse effects on minority students might be easier to justify. In fact, the SAT is a relatively poor predictor. This graph shows the relative weight of high school GPA and test scores in determining the probability that students will uh, graduate from UC within five years. Modal graduation rate is about four years and a quarter, so I've used five years as the, to capture the modal uh, uh, trend here. The blue bars again represent high school GPA and the red uh, SAT scores. The first set of bars shows the relative weight of the two factors alone without controlling for family income or education. As you can see, high school GPA has by far the greater uh, predictor or stronger predictor in a simple two variable regression model. The UC results here have been replicated in a major national study by Bill Bowen called Crossing the Finish Line uh, using a massive sample of uh, 50 universities across the US. So th these findings are, uh, in a, these aren't really new findings, They're, they just uh, replicate uh, uh, what's already been done in, in this area. Um, but this actually overstates the uh, SAT's predictive power. Because family income is also correlated with college outcomes, as well as being correlated with SAT scores, because family background is related to both the de dependent and the independent variable here, much of the apparent predictive weight of the SAT actually reflects the proxy effects of socioeconomic status. So when you control for family income and, uh, and par parental education, holding them constant, uh, the coefficient on SAT scores declines by about a third. Finally, when the results are disaggregated by race, uh, the predictive validity uh, of, the, of SAT scores is diminished still further, especially after controlling for family income uh, and education as shown in the last set of bars. The effect size of the SAT becomes very small indeed. Um, taken together, the findings I've just presented uh, raise fundamental concerns about the costs and benefits of admissions tests such as the SAT. Is the adverse racial effect of, S of the SAT justified in view of its relatively limited benefit in predicting college outcomes? Before turning to those questions, uh, however, it's important to probe the strengths and the weaknesses of the data that I've just presented. How can we be sure that the growing correlation between race, race and SAT scores is real and not, not some kind of statistical artifact or uh, there, may, uh, may, may not be other, there may be other factors at work there? 
For example, uh, two common problems often encountered in regression analysis are multicollinearity multi and interaction effects. This occurs when the variables you're looking at, the predictor variables, are uh, family income, parental education, race, ethnicity, are re related not only to the outcome variable of interest, in this case SAT scores, but they're also related to each other. If, if the predictor variables are too closely related, uh, regression results can be unstable. Uh, and I've checked the data very carefully for this. Uh, I'm not going to go th into this here. If you're very interested in the technical details, go to my paper. I don't want to spend more time on that issue here. Uh, that issue is easily dispensed with. Uh, a more serious problem and a or question to be asked about uh, these data are concerns possible selection effects. Selection effects can occur when one sample, in this case the UC applicant pool, differs from the larger population, in this case the population of SAT takers in California altogether, in some systematic way, thus creating selection bias. When this is the case, it can be the fact that the, this may be just an effect that we're seeing in the applicant pool and we're not seeing in the larger pool of California SAT takers. If true, the growing correlation between SES and SAT scores that I've just presented uh, might simply be an artifact of self-selection amongst those who choose to apply, which California graduates, uh, California high school SAT takers and graduates uh, choose to apply to UC. We will look more closely in the, at this question in the, in the following slides. And finally, one other important concern is missing data on socioeconomic var uh, variables, particularly uh, data on family income. The UC data are very good in respect. Uh, only 14% of the data are on those factors are missing. The problem is with, with the data on California SAT takers, uh, a very large proportion of whom decline to report family income or parental education. And this makes it difficult to compare definitively the UC applicant pool with the, um, uh, with the larger pool of California SAT takers. So we'll look at this data, uh, at this issue too. First, uh, taking first the problem of selection effects, um, this graph compares mean and standard deviation SAT scores for UC applicants versus that of all California SAT takers since 1998. 1998 is the first year for which the College Board has provided state-by-state -state data, including California data, on their SAT takers. So that's, as far as the California SAT taking population, as far as we can go back is 1998. Uh, for both California SAT takers and UC applicants, however, SAT scores have remained remarkably stable uh, since 1998. To be sure, average test scores for UC applicants uh, are higher than that for all uh, California SAT takers, as you'd expect given our more rigorous uh, admission standards. But the key point to note is that the relationship between the two pools has changed little. Mean and standard deviation SAT scores for both UC applicants and California SAT takers in 2011 are virtually identical to 1998. There is no sign that the selectivity of the UC applicant pool has increased relative to the general population of SAT takers during this period. This may surprise some of you, but actually the SAT is designed to do that. Uh, it, it, it's designed to create a bell curve which is remarkably stable uh, from one year to the next. That's one reason why it's not good for measuring changes in how much students have learned, because it remains so stable from one year to next. The next graph examines changes in the racial ethnic composition of California SAT uh, of UC applicants, the red line, compared with both California SAT takers and high school grads over the same period, the blue and green lines respectively. California's emergence as the first majority minority state uh, is reflected in the upward trend lines for each. Uh, the gaps between the, th the lines, of course, are a, a stark reminder if you need one of the continuing educational disparities uh, faced by students of color. But again, the, pe the keynote, uh, key point to note is the slope and relationship amongst uh, or between the three lines over time. Changes in the demographic composition of the UC applicant pool are entirely consistent 
uh, with changes that have occurred uh, among both California SAT takers and high school grads over this same period. Indeed, the gap between UC applicants, the red line, and um, high school grads excuse me, and SAT takers, comparing those two population, the blue line, uh, has actually narrowed in recent years, indicating that the two pools have become more similar than different. Again, there is no indication that the UC applicant pool has become less like the population of California SAT takers during this period. Last, the last slide I presented uh, about the increasing number of minorities, uh, underrepresented minorities, students of color uh, within uh, these various pools, might suggest to you another possible explanation, especially those of you who are more uh, familiar with uh, regression analysis. Uh, another or counter explanation of the growing correlation that we found earlier between race and SAT scores. It may simply, the, the growing correlation may simply reflect the growth in the sheer number of minority students uh, in any of these, any, in all of these populations. That is, the growing number of minority students may have increased the variance in SAT scores amongst these uh, students, which in turn may have increased the strength of the correlation between race and SAT. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the phenomenon of range restriction uh, in dealing with the SAT, I don't know, anybody familiar with range? Ah, uh, this is the reverse phenomenon, range relaxation. Okay. But the data refute this hypothesis. Uh, despite growth in the number and proportion of underrepresented minorities uh, within the UC applicant pool, the variance in their test scores, shown by the standard deviation markers, uh, has changed uh, almost not at all. Uh, uh, the same is true, by the way, of uh, uh, the variance uh, in SAT scores amongst uh, all specific racial ethnic groups in California since 1998. Uh, there's virtually no change in the variance. Uh, despite their growth in the number of these students, the variance in their SAT scores has not changed uh, hardly a whit uh, over time. So there's uh, this explanation, that, or the, the counter explanation that I just suggested doesn't seem to hold up to the data. A more serious problem uh, uh, to confirming or disconfirming the UC findings is the problem of missing data. When students sit for the SAT, they are asked to complete a questionnaire that includes items on family income, education, and race. There have been long been questions about the accuracy of these data, but the most important issue, especially with uh, uh, family income, is the problem of missing data. Uh, the proportion of California SAT takers who declined to report income peaked in 2004 and then declined. Also, you see the peaks here. Uh, students not reporting race, ethnicity, or, uh, uh, or uh, family education. And then declined after that for parental education and race, but has, uh, has uh, greatly uh, increased to the point where uh, today, 55% of all California SAT takers don't report their family income. So this makes it impossible to do uh, a, a strong comparison between the UC applicant pool uh, and the pool of California SAT takers. Uh, for those who do report uh, these variables, the distributions look very similar between UC applicants and California SAT takers. You can't see any difference. But uh, you, they neither definitively confirm nor disconfirm whether the UC applicant data uh, are reflecting of a, a broader pool. And the same issue, by the way, is with the national uh, 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 SAT taking population. Uh, they're uh, just as problematic as the California data. Again, for them, uh, almost the same trends as you see here. More than half of national SAT takers uh, do not report family income. So that means that the regression results that I presented earlier, which depend on having uh, uh, information on all, all of the predictor variables, uh, unless you have information for each case on each of the predictor variables, uh, you can't run a regression. The, the cases with missing data are dropped. Uh, so with the California data, well over half of the, uh, of the data uh, uh, would be uh, would be dropped uh, if of any uh, attempt to replicate the uh, the findings I've just presented with either the California or the national uh, SAT data. The best alternative source uh, 
for, uh, data may be other large uh, state university systems like UC that receive applications from a large number uh, of uh, a proportion of uh, SAT or ACT takers in their states. Because these institutions collect SAT data uh, for uh, purposes of financial aid as well as admissions, the data that they collect tends to be more accurate and complete. Um, at UC, for example, the data is subject to audit. Uh, so that merging test score data uh, with, information, uh, with information from institutional databases is, I think, uh, represents the uh, more promising way uh, for examining uh, changes in the effects of uh, SES uh, on SAT scores over time and replicating uh, the findings that I've just presented on this. Uh, so uh, the paper calls for institutional researchers in other states uh, to, uh, to replicate these findings. It's important that the uh, replication be conducted independently of the college board and the other testing agencies who invariably, uh, their research is invariably supportive of their test, of their test products. And um, uh, well, it's, it's very similar to the situation in medical research a few years ago where you have people who have a vested interest in the results doing the research. Um, uh, so uh, recently, the National Commission on the Use of Standardized Testing in Undergraduate Admissions has called on American colleges and universities to take back the conversation uh, on admission testing. Uh, the commission was chaired by Bill Fitzsimmons, the Dean of Admissions at Harvard, uh, and called for an establishment of uh, establishing an independent national clearinghouse uh, for colleges and universities to share their own data uh, on admissions tests. The clearinghouse would be uh, housed in NACAC, National Association of College Admissions Counseling, uh, which is the uh, largest uh, independent college admissions association in the U.S. outside of the college board. Uh, NACAC has, has agreed uh, to serve as a clearinghouse for this research, for replication of the UC study, and uh, uh, for any institutions that would choose to do so. And it is my hope that institutional researchers in other states are going to pick this up. Assuming that these findings are confirmed, the question naturally arises, why? Why is the correlation between race and SAT scores apparently growing? Now, it's impossible to uh, answer that question with the data at hand that I have at hand, but uh, it, it's at least useful to consider uh, possible explanations that emerge from uh, uh, the research uh, on this topic. The past two decades have seen an extraordinary volume uh, of research on the so-called black-white test score gap, uh, including a great deal of work done on this campus, by the way. Uh, most of that work has focused on tests such as the National Association, excuse me, uh, National Assessment uh, of Educational Progress uh, rather than the SAT, and so is not as directly relevant to the research, I've, to the findings I've just presented as it might be. Also, most of that work has dealt only with black-white test score differences, and so that its relevance to California's growing Latino and Chicano population could be questioned. Uh, nevertheless, that work provides some plausible ex explanations, uh, ex frameworks really, explanatory frameworks um, for that might account for trends observed in the California data. Most research on the black-white uh, test score gap has focused on general socioeconomic factors such as family income, parents' education, or disparities, disparities in the quality of schools that students attend. Economic inequality in particular is often cited in discussions of the black-white test score gap. And that explanation is plausibly consistent with the UC data. The growing SAT score gap between students of color and others parallels the increase, the sharp increase, uh, in income inequality in California and the U.S. Uh, over the past two decades, which has disproportionately affected uh, Latino and black families. Growing income inequality, in turn, translates into a wide range of educational disadvantages, such as poor schools, less as, uh, access to test prep services, a variety of things, uh, which may have a direct effect on SAT scores. While plausible, the main difficulty with this 
explanatory framework is that it does not account for the large residual correlation between race and SAT scores after controlling for family income and, and uh, parental education. Like this data that I uh, presented earlier, studies of the black-white test score gap find that SES differences account for only a portion of the gap, leaving a majority of the gap unexplained. Some researchers believe this may be due to deficiencies in the measures, the conventional measures of socioeconomic status, particularly uh, income. Uh, it's often argued that uh, uh, inequality in wealth, uh, uh, which spans generations, uh, is, is the more significant factor that uh, needs to be considered here. And there's a great deal to be said for that argument. Nevertheless, the assumption that the gap the black-white test score gap uh, is reducible in principle to general socioeconomic uh, factors remains unproven. An alternative uh, explanatory framework uh, looks to factors specifically associated with race. Racial segregation in particular is most frequently cited. Researchers who have studied the black-white test score gap have long noted the coincidence between trends in segregation and trends in the size of the gap. Immediately following the uh, Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education, uh, the black-white test score gap declined significantly in the 1960s and 1970s, as measured by NAEP scores. Uh, Progress in, uh, in uh, uh, reducing segregation um, uh, uh, declined or uh, fell off uh, in the 90s uh, with the um, uh, decision, Supreme Court decisions and other court decisions uh, limiting busing and other school integration measures. Uh, and the black-white test score gap uh, 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 fell off at the, at the same time. Um, so that progress in the narrowing of the school desegregation narrowed in the in 1990s as a result of court decisions. I've said that. Uh, and. And that, uh, that was parallel with the uh, narrowing of the test score gap at the same time. Some of the best work on uh, racial segregation, by the way, and its effect on test scores has been done on this campus. The uh, card rothstein study done in 2007 is probably the best single study uh, that's been done uh, to date. Um, they found robust evidence uh, looking at metropolitan areas uh, all across the U.S. Uh, that, uh, uh, I even have the quote here, uh, that robust evidence that the black-white test score gap is higher in more segregated cities. Now, racial segregation has increased uh, sharply in California over the past two decades and provides another plausible explanation for the growing correlation between race and, race and SAT scores observed in the UC applicant data. A clear pattern of co-segregation of black and Latino students has emerged. To cite just two statistics, the proportion of students in intensely segregated schools, that is 90% or more students of color, has doubled since 1993. And the proportion of so-called apartheid schools, 99% or more students of color, uh, has tripled. Uh, racial segregation has also uh, overlapped with rising poverty levels in these same schools. This pattern of double segregation or even triple segregation when you consider language differences as well has created a perfect storm of uh, social, economic, uh, and educational dis uh, disadvantage. And some researchers believe that these multiple disadvantages may interact to amplify test score gaps. Such interaction or multiplier effects, uh, do you know what an interaction effect is? Yes. Yeah, sort of, <laughs> uh, may explain why the effect of family income uh, uh, on SAT scores is, my, is more than twice as large for black students. Uh, in short, both growing uh, income inequality and racial segregation are plausible explanations of the test score gap. And it is likely that both factors are at work in explaining the uh, trends in uh, SAT scores that we've seen in California. But their relative importance still matters. If segregation accounts for most of the gap, beyond what can be explained by family income or parental education alone, one must be concerned about the Supreme Court's forthcoming decision in the, in the Fisher case, an overbroad decision ending consider, consider, 
consideration of race in college admissions could have significant ramifications uh, for integration efforts affecting a much larger number of students in the nation's schools. Finally, let's turn to the policy implications of the findings. The Bakke decision decisively changed the, the legal rationale for affirmative action. Up to that time, the rationale had been remedial, overcoming racial disparities created by decades of segregation. After Bakke, the policy narrative pivoted uh, to emphasize the educational benefits of racial diversity. The court rejected historical discrimination as a rationale for affirmative action, but accepted that colleges and universities had a compelling interest in achieving racial diversity. In a series of court's decisions since Bakke, the Supreme Court has increasingly restricted the diversity rationale by applying a legal standard known as strict scrutiny. Among other elements, that standard requires that when race is considered in college admissions, its use must be narrowly tailored. First, colleges and universities must make good faith efforts to explore workable race neutral alternatives to achieve diversity by other means. Second, race conscious policies must be temporary and of limited duration. As Justice Sandra Day O'Connor famously opined, we expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary, unquote. The findings I've just presented have bearing on both elements of the narrow tailoring uh, test. Some have suggested that class-based affirmative action, giving preferences to low income or first generation college students might replace race conscious policies, yet produce racial diversity at the same time. The California data suggests strongly, however, that class-based affirmative action is unlikely to provide a workable alternative. Race and ethnicity account for a substantial test score differences after controlling for family income and race ethnicity and, and education, excuse me. Controlling for SES does, leaves a large and growing residual component. And that's the uh, other uh, issue. The correlation between race and SAT scores does not appear to be declining, uh, as Justice O'Connor predicted, but uh, declining if, if our data are any indication. The findings should give pause to those who assume that uh, racial and ethnic differences will uh, inevitably narrow over time. Another implication concerns the underlying rationale for affirmative action itself. This text is from the most recent Standards for Fairness in Testing, published jointly last year by the American Educational Research Association, American Psychological Association, and the National Council on Measurement in Education. The standards do not, of course, have the force of law, but they are an important guide for those who develop and use standardized tests, including colleges and universities. And standard 3.16 is directly relevant to the facts at hand. California data show that test scores have an adverse impact on students of color far out of proportion to their, uh, with their relatively weak validity in predicting college performance. Where test scores are, using the language here, differentially affected by construct ir irrelevant characteristics, as here, test users have a responsibility to take into account their impact on relevant subgroups that is race ethnicity, uh, as shown here. Fairness, in short, requires test users to take race into account in ensuring the test scores are used responsibly. The responsibility to take into account the differential impact and validity of tests across different racial groups harks back to the original remedial rationale uh, for affirmative action. Though the courts may have rejected historical discrimination uh, as a rationale for race conscious admissions policies, fairness standards require that colleges take into account the adverse impact of admissions tests in the present day uh, beyond what can reasonably be justified by their measurement uh, validity. Of course, you will have noted the phrase, where legally permissible. Uh, yeah. What about states such as California? Uh, where considera consideration of race is prohibited by law. I'll return to this issue in a moment. But before that, I'd like to develop just a little bit further the connection between standardized testing and the remedial rationale for affirmative action. At first glance, the findings I presented might suggest a simpler remedy 
for addressing racial disparities in admissions, pursuing a claim of discri discrimination uh, or disparate impact against the SAT or ACT. The likelihood of such a successful challenge is small, however, however, for several reasons. Because the College Board and ACT do not receive federal funding, they are not subject to such claims. Suing colleges and universities that employ the tests is thus the only available judicial remedy. This may be one reason why the diversity rationale has proven more attractive than the older remedial rationale for affirmative action. Emphasizing the benefits of a diverse student body uh, does not expose colleges to the liability that they might face by acknowledging the adverse effect on, of tests on students of color. A second obstacle involves the distinction between discriminatory impact and intent. Unless a college has a clear history of segregation, as in the South, it has become almost impossible to challenge its use of the SAT under an equal protection claim since the courts require a showing of discriminating a discriminatory intent and not merely a, a effect or impact. Federal regulations adopted to imp implement uh, uh, Title VII of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 do prohibit colleges and universities that receive federal funds from engaging in practices that have discriminatory effect uh, with the threat of loss of federal funding. Uh, and uh, in the courts until 1921, uh, 1921, 2001, uh, the courts allowed plaintiff to sue for enforcement of these regulations. But that ended with the Sandoval decision in 2001, where the Supreme Court held that there was no private right of action. You couldn't sue for, private individuals or advocacy groups could not uh, sue uh, for enforcement of federal regulations. Thus, the only remaining uh, remedy is to file an administrative complaint with the U.S. Office of Civil Rights, uh, which may trigger an OCR compliance review, as they're called. Now, even if the uh, claim against the SAT or ACT were to proceed thus far, however, there is no guarantee that it would succeed because of the educational necessity test. In a compliance review, the burden falls on the college or university to demonstrate that the test is an educational necessity. That sounds like more of a burden than it actually is. Rather than being essential or indispensable, the educational necessity standard requires only that the challenge test, quote, serve in some significant way, unquote, or bear a manifest uh, relationship, quote, unquote, to the university's educational purposes. Although SAT scores are a relatively weak predictor of college performance, as we've seen, they do add a small but statistically significant increment to the prediction, and therefore, they are therefore likely to meet a relatively modest standard of educational necessity that the courts have, have uh, set. So it's very likely that they would uh, uh, meet. Uh, just, Analysis of the disparate impact in the SAT draw, draws very much, by the way, on a friend of mine, Bill Kidder, uh, vice chancellor down at uh, UC um, Riverside, uh, a paper that he wrote uh, on this topic. Um, moreover, uh, even if successful, remedial, remedial impact of such a, uh, a legal suit uh, would, be limited, would, would be limited to elimination of the challenge test at the, simple, the, the one institution that was using the test. Uh, it, it wouldn't affect other universities or colleges. It would have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and uh, it would leave in place uh, other uh, factors uh, besides SAT scores uh, that I would argue um, uh, unjustifiably um, uh, disadvantaged students of color in college admissions. And it would only affect the SAT. So uh, in terms of uh, the traditional legal remedy, a disparate impact or a discrimination uh, claim, um, it does not appear that this is a, a promising route to pursue. In a strange irony, the continuing dominance of standardized admissions tests in higher education, now I'm getting to my last couple of points here, uh, may be one of the most powerful arguments for affirmative action. Much of the original impetus for race conscious policies grew out of recognition of the severe adverse impact of SAT scores on admission of students of color. Since then, 
That impact has not only continued, but worsened, if the California data are any indication. Race has become a more important determinant than either family income or parental education in predicting test scores. And the adverse racial impact of the SAT is far out of proportion with its limited validity in predicting college performance. But eliminating admissions tests is not necessarily the answer. First, other criteria employed in college admissions exhibit the same questionable trade-off between adverse impact and measurement validity. Just one quick example. The widespread practice of weighting high school GPA for AP courses has a strong adverse effect on minority students, uh, both at, because they attend schools where those kinds of courses don't tend to be offered, or if they are at the school where those, they're offered, they tend to be tracked out of those same kinds of courses. So in terms of ca calculation of GPA, students of color tend to be uh, uh, disadvantaged by a weighted GPA. Uh, on the other hand, weighted GPA is not a good, is unweighted GPA, if you don't give the extra point for AP and honors courses, is a better predictor of how students will perform at UC. Uh, the SAT is thus not unique. It's only a more extreme in its cost-benefit calculus. Eliminating the SAT by itself would not remedy the many other ways, large and small, that students of color uh, are unjustifiably disadvantaged in contemporary college admissions. Second, a direct challenge to the SAT or ACT is unlikely to succeed insofar as those tests are likely to meet the relatively modest standard of educational necessity that case law requires. Standardized tests, more broadly, have become an entrenched feature of education at all levels, and it's naive, I think, to believe that they will disappear anytime soon. But, and this is the key point, if the SAT is an educational necessity, then so is consideration of race in college admissions. As long as the test continues to be used, standards of fairness require that we consider its unwarranted impact, beyond which can be reasonably justified by its measurement validity. But what about California and other states where universities are forbidden to take into account race in admissions? Some of you have may seen the story about my study in a couple of weeks ago in Inside Higher Education. According to the story, the solution I propose is to go back to what the University of California did when it adopted the SAT, but which support, uh, in other words, return to affirmative action, but which has been barred by the state's voters uh, today. Uh, that's not what I say in the paper, and uh, not, it's. it's uh, I, I, it's not what I believe that the, uh, I could justify by what my findings uh, demonstrate. Uh, in fact, my study was really addressed to, addressed to the larger context in the upcoming Supreme Court decision, which ha may have a much bigger effect on uh, other states than California, where affirmative action continues to be uh, uh, legal in, uh, in college admissions. Uh, so my focus really in writing this paper was on that larger issue. Um, but as for California and other states where affirmative action has been banned by state referenda, I think the implications may be somewhat different. The main takeaway I draw from these findings is the obligation for colleges and universities to use admissions tests responsibly. For colleges and universities that choose to emphasize the SAT and ACT as admissions criteria, Standards for fairness in, in testing require that those institutions take into account the, warn, the unwarranted impact of those tests on students of color beyond what can be re reasonably be justified by measurement validity. Insofar as tests continue to be used in admissions, college must take account of race. But for institutions that choose not to take account of race or are forbidden to do so by state referenda, continued use of such tests becomes difficult, if not impossible, to justify under uh, ex uh, established testing standards. To use tests responsibly, colleges and universities must take into account their differential impact and measurement validity on students of color. If institutions do not or cannot take such effects into account, they have a responsibility to de-emphasize or eliminate, or eliminate such tests as admissions criteria. If we can't use tests responsibly, we shouldn't use them at all. So that's, thanks for hearing me out, and we'll turn now to uh, 
<laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, terrific presentation. Uh, are there any uh, interesting uh, observations uh, based on per campus and the selectivity of a campus during admissions when you look at, so you look at all of UC, if you were to uh, disaggregate by each campus, do you see any particular trend or something that is uh, an additional layer to what you showed? Um, this research is uh, part of a, a long series of studies that we began in 1999 when we were forced to um, uh, revise all of our admissions criteria. And one of the things that UC did at the time, amongst other things, um, was to de-emphasize the SAT in favor of other criteria, such as the top 4% plan, which looked only at students' high school GPA and coursework. But as part of the research leading up to that, both for the president and for boards, the, Cal uh, the Board of Admissions and Relations Schools, the faculty committee responsible, uh, we looked at uh, the predictive validity of SAT scores predicting first-year grades, uh, all the way through college graduation. We sliced it and diced it in every possible way. We looked at it by discipline. We looked at it by campus. We looked at it by racial and ethnic group uh, in every way. And in every comparison, consistently, we found that um, the SAT was a relatively poor predictor of, uh, of student performance in college, however you wish to define outcome criteria. So the, the, that, that finding is robust and consistent across just about any demographic you want to look at. Yes. So uh, thanks for a terrific presentation on with really critical policy implications. Um, you mentioned that one of the hypotheses on what explains this gap is increased racial segregation, I, uh, which is, of course, very difficult to deal with. Uh, but I assume that your data, in fact, must include the school, the high schools that students attend. Unfortunately, I don't have access. To, I'm hoping to get access to that data. I can, oh, okay. Well, that yeah, that, because I'll, I'll, I, I really want to know. You know, is is it just general socioeconomic factors or is something specifically associated with race, such as discrimination and segregation, at work here? Yeah, you know, I've. Probably you can tell what I believe, mm -hmm. but uh, I can't prove it one way or another. And uh, I'm hoping to get that data from OP. Yeah, that, that will be important addition to- There's a problem to... of confiden mm -hmm. confidentiality of student records, is it? Hang up. Oh, we're done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this question really reveals my ignorance. For some reason, I was under the impression that Berkeley had made standardized tests optional. And I don't know why I thought that. Perhaps there was discussion about that? Test optional? I don't think Berkeley's gone test optional. Last time I looked, we're There has not been any discussion of this? Was there a prior? Are, are any uh, board or Chancellor? admissions faculty here? OK, well, I was completely mistaken. I w somehow I had thought that, but never mind. The, the test optional movement has. Uh, and, and there are there's areas of gray in, in the test optional movement because one of the things it does, it can boost a, a, an institution's SAT scores because kids who have bad scores don't submit them, but kids can still submit scores. So some of the schools that have gone test op optional have seen improvement in their SAT <laughs> scores, uh, which doesn't hurt their ranking in US News and World Report, by the way. Which, but, school, uh, which schools have, are there major, which major but, universities but, have gone? But I just wanted to finish. The larger point is that uh, I think there are something over 850 colleges and universities in the U.S. have gone test optional in this way. Uh, but almost all of them, with, small, uh, with few exceptions, are relatively small institutions. Major uh, public universities that receive tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications uh, still rely heavily on the SAT to sort the applicant pool. Thank you. I have a question about immigrant status. I just lived for nine years with students in the dorms, and 
I notice a lot of Asians. And when other people come to the dorms, they say, there's a lot of Asians. But what I see is there's a lot of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if analyses uh, have some way of taking immigrant status or number of generations in America into consideration. I don't have the data to do that, but I agree. It's a, uh, some of the work that we've done here at the center with the student experience in the uh, research university, we found at, at Berkeley especially, there's just huge numbers. What, I, I don't know, if, can you cite the number, Judd? The proportion of 60%. 60%, I think. 60%, 60 had a parent born outside the US. Yes, and so it's really remarkable. And yes, that would be interesting to look at. I don't have that data. And it'd be interesting to see what it showed. Yeah. So, so Saul, you know, one of the um, things that are coming out of the discussions with the uh, governor and the president is this notion of graduating faster and uh, within a four-year period. And, um, you know, that seems, seems like your data would be useful to, to talk about, um, you know, how we could invest in kind of a longer time to degree for some students because they come in disadvantaged and... Uh, you know, we'll admit them somewhere in the UC system. So why don't we stop worrying as much about which UC they land in and invest in trying to give them a better education and a more welcoming environment? Yes. Uh, we lose most of, our, most of the attrition. Uh, and we're not, UC is not unique in this way. Most of the attrition occurs in the first two years. <laughs> College is a culture shock for many students. They're away from home the first time. The academic standards are more rigorous. They have to manage their own lives. And uh, there's reason to believe that the transition would be even greater uh, for uh, uh, students uh, without strong study skills who don't have, for example, the you know, groups, the studying groups, which I see now when you're just walking on campus. Is, it wasn't happening when I was in school. And we, we were all sort of looked at our books alone. But now people study in, in groups. And, and that seems to be a big help. Um, but um, I think I'm wandering off point. Have I answered your question? Sort of. Uh, I, I'm senior moment. I, I lost track of what I was going to say. We have time for one more question. Hi, thanks. That was uh, very informative. Uh, I have two questions. First, are your data public? Can, uh, I, can no, other people analyze I would, them? Uh, you know, it's the responsibility of a researcher uh, to assist other researchers who wish to replicate Terrific. their study to get the data. Thank you. And uh, I assume from your raising your hand that you're a reputable researcher to the, some of the earlier questions. Uh, reputable, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if you would email me and uh, 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 yeah, I will sure. uh, put a word for you with you. I, I, of course, I do not, I cannot release. I receive my data under uh, a confidentiality agreement that I would not share with any third parties. But my responsibility is to, I could intercede to uh, suggest that uh, that would be terrific. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you've probably gone through everything that I'm thinking about. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious as to what has happened to the income distribution of the parents of applicants to the UC system over the period of your analysis, which is quite long. I mean, after all, we now have many more out-of-state applicants. Yes, we have. Uh, we do. Uh, and so if, if that... We do, but I don't know how much diversity, racial and ethnic-wise, we draw from that. Right, so my, 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 I guess what I'm thinking about if, is if that is becoming more homogenous, then it will be less of a predictor anyway, right? Ah. And so, so if that were becoming more homogenous, uh, less homogenous, then your findings would be so much stronger. Yes. Whereas if that is becoming very tight, then you would not expect a lot of predictive power there. I'll, I've look, I haven't looked at, I'll, I'll look at that. Would you send me an email? Sure. We can, we can talk about this sure. by email. thank you. Let's give Saul another hand.